Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Cascade 2017. I'm excited to have two days with you to share ideas, to network with each other, to have you influence our thinking for the coming year. I decided for today that I should pick an important topic to discuss as the subject of the keynote. So let me share that topic with you. It's expense management and the meaning of life. We don't mess around at Chrome River. So I'd like to tell you what inspired uh, this topic. Our defense secretary is Jim Mattis. He was known as General Mad Dog Mattis before he joined the administration. And he made a speech on August 9th at the naval base in Kitsap, Washington to the crew of the USS Kentucky. USS Kentucky is a submarine that's part of our national nuclear deterrent force. And in that speech, he thanked the members of the crew for their service to the Navy. And I'd like to read to you a part of the official Pentagon transcript from that speech. He uses somewhat colorful language. So he thanked the crew, and then he said, quote, that means you're living. That means you're not some pussy sitting on the sidelines. You know what I mean. Kind of sitting there saying, well, I should have done something with my life. Because of what you're doing now, you're not going to be laying on a shrink's couch when you're 45 years old saying, what the hell did I do with my life? Why? Because you served others. You served something bigger than you. End of quote. So I think General Mattis has a good point. We all need meaning in our lives. Serving others and helping our community gives us meaning. But for those of us in this room, there's two problems with his speech. First of, us, first of all, not all of us could be in the Navy or not even in the US Armed Services. What do we do? And the second, General Mattis implied that 45 years old is somewhat near the end of your life. <laughs> and for those of us who are kind of looking at 45 in the rearview mirror, wondering what we can do still to serve our, serve our community. So I have a second point that I'd like to address today. In the spring 2016 MIT Sloan Management Review, there was an article entitled, Leading by the Numbers. That article quoted a CFO that estimated that his organization had only about a 30% success rate when promoting finance people to leadership roles in or across business units. That's a terrible percentage of success. If we want to prepare ourselves for roles throughout our business, prepare ourselves to grow our careers, what should we be doing? So those are the topics I'd like to address today. And I'd like to start out by saying, well, what is our role as people who run the expense management systems in our companies? If you look at any Los Angeles Police Department car, on every single door, it says to protect and to serve. And I think that's the number one role that we have in expense management, to protect and to serve, to be the police, you might say, for our companies. I'm gonna talk about that. And our second role is we can even do more than that. Being in finance, we can actually save our companies money and control our costs, and I'll discuss that issue as well. So to help put this in perspective, I have seven kind of data points that I'd like to share with you. And maybe when we have that common base of information, we'll be able to step back and reach some conclusions. This picture is of James Falkowski, former director of strategic brands at QVC. 
He's on the screenshot of a news program because he was indicted this month. He ran fraudulent invoices and expense reports through the QVC system, and those overstated expense reports resulted in money that was spent on spa treatments, Botox at New York City dermatologists, which are apparently expensive dermatologists, clothing and restaurant meals, he went on a vacation in Europe. He took his friends to a party in Turk and Caicos. And for those of you who are monitoring expense reports, you should watch out for this. He spent $59,000 on prepaid gift cards. It was a total of $1 million in the indictment. Let's get our second data point. This is a picture of Ken, Kevin Coleman, now the former CEO of Latex International in Kentucky. In this picture, the man holding his head is Mr. Coleman's lawyer. <laughs> he used his corporate card to buy diamond jewelry, a Harley Davidson. He bought a car for his mistress in London. He spent thousands on first class airfare a total of over $1.7 million. Included as part of the conspiracy was his company's HR director. She concealed the CEO's records and turned in $531,655 of her own fraudulent expense reports. Mr. Coleman was sentenced to 70 months in prison, more than the federal sentencing guidelines. Our third data point comes from Indiana. Donis Mazel, now the former CEO of Hendricks Power Cooperative in Indiana, was sentenced to 33 months in federal prison for having turned in six years worth of fraudulent expense reports running around $600,000, somewhat more mundane expenses in Indiana, pizza, Mother's Day brunch, <laughs> iPhones and iPads and jewelry. He had no criminal history, and his lawyer is quoted as saying he's a dedicated family man, a community volunteer who worked with the Boy Scouts. So let me stop for a minute, and let's see what we have from these three data points so far. We see that we have fraud from some of the most senior people in the organization who are taking large amounts of money, who have, to our knowledge, no pressing financial needs and, to the best of our knowledge, they never stole anything in their lives before. Our next data point comes from England, Exeter, England. CPS stands for the Crown Prosecution Service, much like our district attorneys. Senior Crown Prosecutor Owen McCarthy filed false expense reports for 5,780 pounds. It was 62 different mileage claims. That comes out to about $120 per report that he used, according to him, to pay for his son's university tuition. He was fired, he's about to be disbarred, his marriage collapsed, and he's in jail for six months. So maybe this problem that we have our data points on only affects rare individuals, maybe out of the millions of people filing expense reports. This is a strange and rare occurrence. So let's look at a few more data points. This is from the Minneapolis Star Tribune that decided to examine the Minneapolis school district's expense reports. They looked at a six month period and sampled 270 expense reports and found out that 50% of them had no receipts attached, even though that's a basic requirement of the school's policy. And they found many, call it suspicious expenses that were spent at Target and Walmart and other places where normally expenses shouldn't be spent. So I've decided to find a slightly more scientific source to share with you that did a more comprehensive analysis, Men's Health Magazine. Men's Health Magazine recently did a comprehensive study on ethics and morality entitled, Are You a Righteous Dude? I'm gonna quote from that article. Because if you're slipping up 
in turning into the kind of jerk even you can't respect, you're undermining your health and happiness. But if you feel good about yourself, you're probably well-nourished with virtue." End of quote. In Men's Health Poll of 1,430 men, fully 20% admitted to padding their expense reports. What's equally interesting is they did an identical survey 10 years earlier, and they found out that the number of people admitting to fraudulent expense reports had increased by 82%. My final story comes from Germany. The 57-year-old secretary, identified in the German media as Magdalena H., worked for the Builders Association in the state of North Rhine-Westphalia for 34 years. Last July, she organized a conference buffet for her boss and his guests and helped herself to two rolls and a fricadella. Frikadella is a German meatball specialty. She was discovered and promptly fired. So this, of course, became known as the Frikadella fracas and resulted in a lawsuit over her dismissal in which her boss claimed, even in hindsight, he was completely right in terminating her employment. Let's step back again now. We've looked at our seven data points. And let's see what we can conclude so far. The problem seems to be widespread. It involves large and small amounts of money. It impacts those with financial means as well as those without. So let's see if we can find some explanation for these behaviors. There is, in fact, new scientific research on this topic that can explain the data points we've seen. I've shown you the extremes, conspiracies of hundreds of thousands of dollars down to a meatball. And let's examine what science has to say. Researchers at the University of Helsinki have found a genetic mutation that causes those who carry it to act recklessly and impulsively. I'm going to quote from Professor Rup Tikkanen, who led the study. Quote, a point mutation in the serotonin 2B receptor gene can render the carrier prone to impulsive behavior, particularly when drunk. The results also indicate that persons with this mutation are more impulsive by nature, even when sober, and they are more likely to struggle with self-control or mood disorders. Now, I remember in my college days studying this topic, and I found that people, when drunk, act more impulsively. So I agree with the outcome of this study. If you think about the people in your company that are struggling, you can now understand it is not necessarily their fault. They are mutants. <laughs> they are impulsive. You are there to protect them from themselves. Now, I have been thinking, what could those of us at Chrome Diver do to help in this project? And I think I have a genius idea. So I'm going to show it to you, and you applaud if you like this idea. It is the Chrome River <laughs> breathalyzer. <laughs> there you go for our marketing department of scientific study. You would simply breathe into the device before you are allowed to submit your expense report. <laughs> All right. Now, for those of us who don't necessarily have the serotonin 2B receptor gene abnormality, we can still look at the physiology of the human brain. Professor Robert Sapolsky of Stanford University in his book behave, the biology of humans at our best and worst, sees moral behavior as a dance between two parts of your brain, in particular, two parts that are located in the front of your brain. 
The first part is known as the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. We're going to call it the DLPFC. It's involved when doing difficult ethical things. It's active when you're passing up short-term rewards in exchange for something better in the future. In studies where researchers directly stimulated the DLPFC with an electric current, subjects found it more difficult to lie, even when they had been instructed to do so. The second part of the brain is called the ventomedial prefrontal cortex, and it lights up when emotional decisions are involved. And almost all human decisions involve emotions. So people with damaged VMPFCs behave in inappropriate, detached ways. Now here's what's particularly interesting. When we think about our own actions, the VMPFC is active. When we think about other people's actions, the DLPFC is stimulated. So it turns out there is a physiological basis why people are hypocrites. <laughs> to quote Professor Sapolsky, we judge ourselves by our internal motives and everyone else by their external actions. If I interpret that, it means when we file a false expense report, we can find a million justifications. But these justifications we would find completely unacceptable when other, other people behave this way. Remember Donis Hendricks, Donis Mazel, I'm sorry, of Hendricks Power? I'm going to read to you from his court sentencing memo. Donis Mazel was a foolish and short sighted employee who let himself believe he was entitled to more than his fair share in his legitimate salary. He was misguided by his own skewed perception of his contribution to the high level of performance of the organization he was leading." End of quote. In other words, when he stole from the cooperative, he actually felt justified in doing so. The brain studies show that cheating is not limited by risk. It's limited by our ability to rationalize that cheating to ourselves. That secretary, Magdalena, could easily rationalize the fricadella, and that's why she ate it. Lying, including rationalizing, makes it feel less dishonest. Those who have trouble resisting the temptation to lie simply have a weaker DLPFC. Quote, People with damage to the DLPFC are less likely to take honesty into account when honesty and self-interest are pitted against each other in an economic game. That's a quote from the professor's book. So our job is to prevent people from hurting themselves. We're looking around our companies, finding those poor souls who have weak dorsolateral prefrontal cortexes and preventing them from ruining their lives. That's our job. Imagine that Owen McCarthy, that prosecutor in England, he, had he been stopped after his very first bad mileage claim, we could have prevented him from ruining his life for a tiny amount of money. His rationalization of paying for his son's tuition tipped him over the edge, and we could have stopped him. There's one more interesting point from Professor Sapolsky's book. Why is it that some people don't cheat? In fact, the good news is most people don't cheat. It turns out that their DLPFC, their prefrontal cortex, shows no activity when presented with an opportunity to cheat. What does that mean? It means honesty is built into many people. I don't know whether it's by nature or by training, but fortunately, the majority of people are just inherently honest. So in summary, one aspect of our job in protecting and serving our companies is to block bad behavior. And when we do that, it really means that we're helping people. I'd like to look at a second aspect of our job 
another way that we can help the companies we serve. And there are many such ways that we can save money and help our companies, and I've decided to just pick two of them to remind us of the spectrum of opportunities that we have. And I've picked two of them that particularly involve businesses with international operations. The Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the United States makes it illegal for companies and their employees to influence foreign officials with any personal payments or rewards. It is enforced by both the SEC and the US Department of Justice. So I'd like to tell you three stories about FCPA enforcements. Bruger Corporation, a Boston-based maker of scientific instruments, paid a $2.4 million fine for making improper payments to government officials in the form of payments for sightseeing trips and shopping expenses, of course, submitted on their expense reports. The total payments for travel were only $119,710, but the SEC said it resulted in ill-gotten profits of $1.7 million. The second story I'll read to you from the official news release. California-based telecoms maker UT Starcom agreed today to pay the Justice Department $1.5 million in criminal fines and the SEC an additional $1.5 million in penalties to resolve Foreign Corrupt Practices Act violations in China and Thailand. Its employees, according to the Department of Justice release, arranged and paid for employees of Chinese state-owned telecommunication companies to travel to popular tourist destinations in the United States, including Hawaii, Las Vegas, and New York City. They weren't super bright because it says that although the trips were supposed to be for training at UTSI facilities, UTSI has no facilities in the destinations and conducted no training. The company's China subsidiary falsely recorded training expenses when the actual purpose was to obtain and retain lucrative telecommunications contracts. Here's what the SEC had to say. Quote, UT Starcom spent millions of dollars on illegal bribes to win and keep customers in Asia, said Mark J. Fagel, the director of the SEC's San Francisco regional office. It is important for corporate America to recognize that resorting to these methods of boosting profits contributes to a culture of corruption that cannot be condoned under US law." End of quote. The third story is from FLIR Systems of Oregon, a leader in thermal imaging systems. And here's what's interesting. They paid no penalty, even though two of its employees were fined for taking Saudi government officials on a world tour and then turning in false expense reports. The SEC noted the company had a code of conduct, required accurate expense reporting with no thresholds for violations, and properly trained their employees. So it turns out when it comes to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, Chrome River and your t and &E system is the very first line of defense. Evidence of the proper use of our system to monitor this can save your company millions of dollars not to mention, of course, the negative publicity of having people like me read about your company publicly. <laughs> My next topic on how we can save our company money is a subject dear to many of us, value added taxes. Now, when I say those three letters, V-A-T, I almost always get the following reaction. VAT has been implemented in 145 out of 183 economies in the world, almost every major economy outside of ours. KPMG estimates that 5% of every foreign business trip is spent on VAT. And the OECD in Europe estimates that 50% of the companies recover 50% or less of the VAT that they spent. So there's a huge pool of money not being claimed. Most of the Chrome River customers, this is primarily relevant for the European Union. And not everyone is aware that there's been a huge change 
and the way that this is handled. The previous recovery system had a catchy name. It was known as the 8th VAT Directive. The UK government themselves, in one of their publications, called that system lengthy, burdensome, and paper-based. If you paid VAT, say hotel expenses, in five different countries, you had to apply to each country with paper forms and copies of the paper receipts as documentation in order to get the VAT refund, and they could pay you whenever and if ever they wanted. That all fortunately changed a few years ago with another even more catchy named document called the Council Directive 2008-9-EC. And that document really changed the world of VAT. It means that you can reclaim VAT electronically, that they have to pay you their money in four months, and most important of all, you can apply in your own country. That means if you were, let's say, had a UK operation and you had spent this money in five different European countries, you would simply just apply to the UK to get all of your money back. If your company isn't taking advantage of these new jurisdiction guidelines, you could be leaving very significant money on the table. So let's review again where we're at. On a daily basis, we're helping both the people we work with and the companies we work for. And I want to address now my third point. What can we do, all of us in this room, to help make ourselves better business leaders? <clears throat> what can we do to prepare for leadership roles throughout the organization? Simon Trott has one of my very favorite corporate business titles I've ever heard. He is managing director of Diamonds, Salt, and Uranium. A great title at Rio Tinto. He was quoted in that article that I mentioned to you in the MIT Sloan Business Review, and I'm going to read to you what he said. It is critical to see that actually my role in the business is to create wealth. It is quite different thinking than how finance traditionally sees their role in the business as a protector of wealth. But business leadership is trying to turn $1 into $2, and that is quite different. Creating value is essential to how a business leader's success is measured, and this can be a very difficult transition for finance professionals because we have been assigned roles early in our careers that lean towards risk mitigation and protecting assets. And now, the way forward is to show how we can create value and create wealth. So I want to share with you some ideas on how Chrome River can help you create value. But first, let me frame the problem. The accounting information that we produce is today, in my opinion, fundamentally flawed in four basic ways. First, it's too late. The financial information that you're reporting on already happened. You're reporting on the world through the rearview mirror. Second, it's too aggregated. It's very difficult to know what to do with the financial information that we produce. If I tell you that travel expenses are up 15% over last year. Is that good or is it bad? Does it reflect business activity that's up and that there's excitement on it? Or does it simply reflect profligate spending and the lack of adequate controls? Finally, the information we produce is too accounting oriented. Almost all of us produce information that, for example, says how much did we spend on meals? Well, very few people actually care about that, but we track it that way because the IRS has different tax treatment on meals. But how do we turn that into valuable management information? And the information that we produce is a snapshot. It's a moment in time, a month, a quarter, maybe even a year, but how do we make sure we're looking at the big trends and the big pictures? So I'd like to say that we can be more than just cost control. And I'm going to focus on one concept today. 
on how we can support the chief marketing officer and the people that head up sales in our organizations and help them drive revenue and increase profitability. <clears throat> Today, many companies are starting to calculate a vital metric, customer profitability. Let's define what customer profitability is. Over time, the value of a customer's revenue stream that exceeds the cost stream of attracting, selling, and servicing that customer. That means we're looking at the entire lifetime, the customer lifetime value of a customer, and looking at the complete profit picture of that customer. It's definitely not a traditional accounting object. It's forward-looking. It's not just a moment in time. It's disaggregated, it's down to the customer level, and it's actionable. In a study by V. Kumar and Denise Shah, again from the MIT Sloan Management Review, they found an extremely skewed distribution of customer profitability when they examined some companies. 20% of the customers accounted for 90% of the profits. A high customer, a high profit customer, someone with a high customer lifetime value, generated 25 times more value than the low profit customer. For most companies, it's even worse. This is sometimes known as the whale curve. You draw this for your company by taking your most profitable customers and starting on the left. And you put each customer's extra profit that they're generating next to it going, moving to the right. The vertical axis shows the company's cumulative profit. What you'll notice is that the line will start to go down. That means that you have customers that are losing money for your company. It might be that 30% of your customers making, are making up 500% of your profits, and the rest of your customers might be losing money. How do we figure this out? <clears throat> we need to collect the costs of the business and distribute them to cost objects. Cost objects might be products or customers or processes, but the distribution will continue until everything is allocated to the final cost object, which in our case is the customer. There are in a business some things called business sustaining costs, that don't have to be allocated, or maybe they're allocated on a arbitrary formula. Now, how does that relate to us, those of us in this room? We can determine a key part of the directly controllable costs. We're capturing customer-specific work activities. We're capturing vital information on marketing, sales, and account management. <clears throat> if we can successfully do that, the goal is to produce at least conceptually, a chart like this that looks at your business in three dimensions. One dimension is the current value of the pro customer, the profits they're producing now. The second dimension is the potential value, the future stream of profits that that customer is going to produce. And the third <clears throat> is the loyalty, the likelihood that that customer will stay and continue to do business with you. The shaded cube represents the top of each of these dimensions. Those are your most valuable conceptual customers. Those are the ones that are going to drive your revenue and profits in the future. At this conference, we're going to be introducing a new product called Chrome River Prosper. We picked the name somewhat different from our traditional naming conventions because Prosper is all about how to help your companies drive revenue and profits. It involves allocating your travel and entertainment expenses direct to customers, accounts, and opportunities. And the way we do this, at least in our first version of the product, is that we integrate directly with those of you who are using salesforce.com. We take the information and pull it into our system, 
and make that information available when appropriate to the people filling out their expense reports. So just as today they can allocate to cost centers, they are now going to be able to allocate to particular accounts and opportunities. We're going to be directly collecting the costs that are driving the sales and revenue of your business. Now, for some of you that don't have the ability to do the full cost allocation exercise that I have outlined, we're going to also deliver, I think, a fantastic tool that can be used by your sales and account management team. We have developed a new intuitive way to make this information easily visible to the team, showing it on both a geographic basis together with the numbers behind it. <clears throat> Let's go back to what we can do to add value. I'm going to again quote from that article. The true value that financial leaders need to offer is not in the accuracy or timeliness of the data, but in the translation of the numbers, the ability to create meaning and simplicity from them, as well as communicate a point of view about how the numbers will inform a strategic decision. Chrome River Prosper was built to help you achieve that, to help you deliver meaning and actionable information to your business leaders. I think the next step in accounting is predictive accounting. Can we help management understand where future profits are going to be coming from? Once we can categorize our customers, then we can help our companies in their tactical decisions. As company leaders, we need to make sure that we're keeping our most profitable customers and working to make our other customers move up and to the right in this chart, taking our greatest potential customers and our most profitable customers and making sure that we treat them and maintain their business. We believe that with Prosper, you can do more than protect your company, more than help your company save money, you can drive revenue and profits. General Mattis challenged us to look at our lives and see if we are helping others, if we are contributing to the greater good. I believe that we have answered that challenge. Number one, we are helping the people in our company. Number two, we are helping our company itself save money. Number three, we can help our own careers, and we do that by creating value for our businesses. A couple of weeks ago, in the August 15th, 2017 issue of Time Magazine, they reported on a study from the National Center for Health Statistics that showed that from 2011 through 2014, the most recent data available, more than one out of eight people, that's close to 13% of people 12 years and older, said they took an antidepressant last month. Wow, that's up and that's a big number. My goal at Chrome River, very ambitious. My goal is that none of us should be enriching the drug companies and we should wake up every day knowing that expense management and what we're doing at Chrome River is making a difference. Thank you very much. <laughs>